This is St. Mary's Ifley. It's one of the most spectacular Romanesque parish churches in England. Romanesque is an architectural style, the first developed in the 11th and 12th centuries after the Norman Conquest. And it's characterized by thick stone walls, high square towers, round arches, and intricate stone carvings, of which we'll see a lot more later. The church stands on a bluff above the River Thames, scarcely two miles from the center of Oxford. It's surrounded by fields, the picturesque village of Ifley, a medieval rectory, and to the south, the rebuilt manor house, Court Place. The church remains almost unchanged since it was first built in 1160, but it still serves as an active place of worship for the communities of Ifley Village, Rose Hill, and Donington. But the peaceful rural setting does nothing to prepare you for the riot of intricate detail which we will see on the West Front in a moment. The West Front of Ifley Church looks out over the River Thames across fields and meadows. It can be seen from the other side of the river and makes for an impressive sight. west door of the church which is the main entrance to the church and we're looking at these two rows of fantastic beak heads you see there's an outer row and an inner row going round here um, these beak heads are you can see that they are the heads of birds and then they've got these fat sharp beaks clamped onto the row going underneath them and these beak heads date to the 12th century, so they're between 800 and 900 years old. So in 2019, I was really lucky. I was one of the people on the um, Living Stones um, weekend of um, stone masonry, and all the participants got to carve a voussoir. And a voussoir is basically one of the beak heads, sort of shaped like that. And it was an amazing experience because you really felt what it would have been like to be a 12th century stonemason. So we were here in the churchyard. I'd never carved any stone before, but just to feel what it was like to hold a chisel and a hammer and work on stone just made me feel really connected with those medieval stonemasons. It was also the sound because we were here on a Sunday morning and there was the kind of tink, tink, tink of the hammer on the chisel. And you just thought, we. Apart from the slight noise of the ring road, we could be here in the 12th century. This is what it would have sounded like. What I'm going to talk about today are the zodiac signs on the church door. So above me here is the sign of Pisces. Yin and yang formed two fish that are linked uh, by a thread. That's probably the sign that you will recognize first um, on the door as an, a sign of the zodiac. So what does it stand for in the Middle Ages? So the Middle Ages uh, thinks that everything is part of the same created universe. God has created sky, earth, water, uh, human beings, and everything is linked together. So Pisces are part of this linking of microcosm and macrocosm. Other signs from the zodiac uh, might also be available here on the west door. Um, so if you just look below Pisces, you see a figure which seems to be running, perhaps carrying something. So this might be um, the figure of Aquarius. You see uh, him running here with the water jugs. Uh, balancing it. We often think of medieval people as living simple lives and in many ways they did but they also lived very complicated lives and that's what I mean when I talk about there being a spiritual aspect of very simple spiritual aspect to what they thought and believed and a very very deep and and fearful aspect to the myth. 
but the one thing that they really could count on was the Bible. And the Bible, as it was revealed to them, came through four different voices, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they both they told the same story of Christ's birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection from slightly different angles. And it all added up to a story they could rely on, whereas they weren't so sure about things like where the stars moved, or why the seasons were different, or what this or that, and these were sort of myth. The description of the church by Nicholas Pesano in his volume on Oxfordshire's churches, he said something along the lines that this was one of the most magnificent parish churches in England, and it must have had a rich patron. And that got me to thinking because he also mentioned that the Lord of the Manor there, or here at the time, was a Robert de saint Remy, a relatively insignificant knight. Uh, he did attend the royal court, he, he witnessed charters in the royal court, but he wasn't very important. So how come that he built this absolutely astonishing church? The reason was that the building was built or financed by the family of Geoffrey Clinton, who was a hugely important man, very loyal to the king, who gave him Kenilworth Castle in Warwickshire. Geoffrey Clinton acquired this village in 1156, and one of his daughters uh, had a child who married into the San Remy family, who became lords of the manor here. And it seems that the money for building this church came from the Clinton family as a sort of marriage dowry, if you like, for this woman who married Robert de saint Remy, And their daughter, called Juliana, gave the church to Kenilworth Priory. A gift that you wouldn't make unless there was some close family connection. So it looks as though the money for this church, which is absolutely outstanding in its detail and, and quality, came from the Clinton family, who were royal servants of huge importance in the country in the 12th century. Outdoor here, that this clever mix of kind of realistic, you've got the Norman knights coming and you've got Henry II, who's, who's the king when, when this was built. But you've also got the mythological creatures as, as well. You've got the centaur family up here, the, a mother feeding their child, and uh, another centaur trampling on a sheep and giving her some food. You've got a merman up there, um, and also you've got a, a green man here with the foliage coming out of his mouth. And he's actually sort of more of a, a green cat than a green man. And uh, it seems that, that this was a kind of feature of, of sculptures around the 12th century and uh, in France as well as Britain. Um, and so you, you've got that kind of film aspect of it as well. One of the things that I like most about the church is obviously because it's so old then it's been going on for like hundreds and hundreds of years and so you have all these memorials inside on the walls um, which I really like reading. Most of them are from the 1800s but it's like it's so cool thinking that people have literally been going here for like what 900 years. So what I really like about the church is so it's, it, it's got these arches and they were built like right when it was when the church was first built like back in the 12th century um, and they're so detailed they have all of these zigzag uh, 
patterns. On one of the arches, it has this really small detail, but it stands out kind of a lot because um, it's like a little nest that is that looks that I thought was a basket at first, but then I saw it was more like a nest because a bird was coming out of it. About 50 years after the church was built, a noblewoman named Honora chose to come here and become an anchoress. A cell was built against the walls of the church, enclosing her within, and she never left for the rest of her days, praying for the church and for the souls of those who worshipped there. The reason we think Honora was here was this arch here in the wall which has been blocked in. We believe that would have been the window of her cell, so from here she could see the, the altar in the church. She lived here for the rest of her life. Part of the vow was you stayed in your cell until you died. The massive square stone tower of the church can be seen from the river and beyond. Interestingly, the openings for the bells which face the manor house have intricate carvings. Well, one of them does. The second opening remains unfinished. The tower was subject to high quality restoration in the 1970s, which gave it very fine carvings uh, in the same pattern as the original by Michael Grozer. This is the oldest yew tree in Oxfordshire. It's about 1,500 years old, which makes it over 500 years older than the church itself. This tree has a pretty good story about it. <laughs> the author of Alice in Wonderland, Lewis Carroll, supposedly came downriver to Iffley Church with his friend Alice Liddell. And as he walked around this churchyard and explored underneath the tree, he saw inside the hollow trunk and a hole, a rabbit's hole, disappearing deep into the ground. And I wonder whether this was the spark that got him thinking about having adventures underground and that turned into the story of Alice in Wonderland. I'm Keith, the Ifly Tower Captain, um, and we, we ring the bells here for services every Sunday for the bringing the new year in, um, bringing Christmas Day, and also for weddings and, and funerals. Um, we've six bells in our tower, which actually is very spacious, so you often have more squeezed into a, a tower than of our size than, than six. Our heaviest bell is um, around about 10 hundredweight, which is um, about half a ton, um, but that can still easily be run by, by one person. When you first enter the church, your eye is drawn to the massive stone arches which support the weight of the tower. At the eastern end of the long open space of the church stands the altar, but to reach it you have to pass an obstacle. For the first thing you see upon walking through the doors of Ifley Church is the huge stone font. Here is the beginning of the Christian's journey both physically and spiritually. Baptism constitutes the washing of sin from the body and spirit, beginning the soul's journey towards heaven. The stone that Ifley's font is made of is very unusual. It's black tournay marble, which is a kind of limestone that comes from Belgium, from Tournay, where the great quarries were used for the building of Tournay Cathedral in the middle of the 12th century, just before the building of Ifley Church and a great many other churches in England which were being, at that time, built or rebuilt. Ifley's font is not carved. It's completely plain, but it still stands on its original central base and is supported by three of the original four 
spiral columns at the corners. So it was uh, making this window is one of the great um, joys and privileges of, of my life because it's it's such a glorious church. Uh, this window is to be um, about the death and the resurrection. It was needed to relate to the, the font um, because this is really the baptistry of the church as you as you come into it uh, and the font is the first thing that that meets you. And so I, I made a kind of river at the bottom of the, of the picture that sort of flows down, the river of life flowing down to the font in, in this window. And so I'd ask people to come up with suggestions and uh, it would be nice to have a fish in the, in the window that, um, that uh, someone else suggested that as the Piper window had a tree of life and I painted many sort of um, pictures on the theme of the tree of life, I ought to have a tree of life, but I, I ended up with a, with a flowering tree with Christ in the centre of it and a river of life flowing from below. Some of the earliest Christian paintings and mosaics have this exactly that sort of theme in it, so that was a great reassurance. The cock stands at the top of the tree, calling out the news that Jesus is born. He says, Christus natus est. Christ is born. The goose asks, Quando, quando? When, when? The rook answers, In hack noct. On this night. The owl calls, Ubi, Ubi, where, where? And the lamb bleats, Bethlehem.